Girl. Hey dolls, it's me, Wilma Finger Do, with another makeup and movies. This week's makeup, one of my favorite palettes from Ace Beauty. This is the Nostalgia palette. I love this. As you can see, it's gorgeous. Lots of color, lots of pigmentation, lots of blendability. So sit back and relax as I talk about some like it hot and pretty up. Okay, so we're ready to go. I am wearing my Lard Souza design uh, Wilma Girl based on Funny Girl the movie. I love this t-shirt so much. Thank you, Lard. God bless you. I've also got my cup of tea because, well, we're operating with heavy machinery and I don't need to be drinking while I'm doing that. And this week's makeup is from Ace Beauty, or as I like to call them, Ace Beauté. It's their nostalgia palette. This is just absolutely stunning. I think that this palette looks like a 1950s Carmen Miranda movie poster. It's just got all those classic bright, bright, bright colors. And this week I'm going to be sticking with these uh, purples and pinks and this lovely watermelon color. And then this yellow and this metallic yellow uh, will be going on my eyelid. Something new that I'll be using this week is from Juvia's Place. It's their eyelid primer. The first eye primer I ever got was by Urban Decay. It was their Eden and it was very dry. I, I'd never used eye primer before so I didn't know if it was good or bad. It just, I noticed that it was dry. And then everyone had been talking about P. Louise but you couldn't really get P. Louise in Canada. Uh, and then Sephora started carrying it and for $22 for a tube this size. So I got one. This, Juvia's Place has three of these uh, in shades one, two, and three. So one is the uh, fairest, there's the mid-tone, and then the deepest tone. These are only $12. Even when I pay for shipping, these are cheaper than P. Louise. Now, this is also a little looser than P. Louise. P. Louise is more of a paste, almost like a toothpaste. This is like a foundation consistency. So there's the makeup. The movie that we are talking about is Some Like It Hot, which was released in 1959 by United Artists. It was directed by Billy Wilder, and he was known, he was quite a well-established director at the time. He'd been nominated for an Oscar for Double Indemnity in 1945. He won two Oscars for The Lost Weekend. He he won Best Screenplay for Sunset Boulevard, and he directed A Stalag 17, Sabrina, Witness for the Prosecution. So he was a very established uh, director. Some Like It Hot was voted number one on the American Film Institute's list of 100 funniest movies of all time in 2001. It was voted number 22 for the greatest movie of all time in 2007 by the American Film Institute. This was a very risque film for its time. It was filmed in uh, uh, 1958, and there was something called the Hayes Code still going on in Hollywood. This was a morals code, uh, something that the motion picture industry was using at the time. And uh, because this movie plays with uh, cross-dressing themes and hints at homosexuality, this would have been a film that it wouldn't have okayed. They just thought, fine, we'll, we'll take our chances with it. Either they'll ban it or it'll get a limited release or whatever the thought was. But it was so well received as a movie that it was considered to be the nail in the coffin for the Hayes Code. The Hayes Code was finally abolished in 1960. So I, I think this, you could say that this film helped get it there. This film was written by I.A.L. Diamond and Billy Wilder. They wrote a bunch of movies together. I think over nine years they worked together. But it's based on a 1951 German film called Fanfaren de Liebe, which means fanfares of love. But that film was a remake of an older French comedy, French farce, called Fanfares de Moore. It was done in 1935. Now, both of these pictures were based on the theme of men doing whatever they can to earn a buck. And in uh, both movies, there was a scheme involving them dressing like women in an all-female band. Now, Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon star in this, but they weren't the first choices. Danny Kaye and Bob Hope were considered for the lead roles, but Wilder saw Tony Curtis in the film Houdini, and thought he would be perfect for Joe. He also thought that Jack Lemmon, who was a newcomer at the time in Hollywood, would be perfect for Jerry, but the studio worried about ticket sales because Jack Lemmon wasn't a big box office draw, and with the themes of the movie, they were afraid that they might have a bit of a, a battle trying to get people into the theater to see it. So other people were considered. Jerry Lewis was considered for the part of Jerry. Uh, now, Jerry Lewis and Tony Curtis were friends. In fact, uh, Jerry Lewis uh, witnessed Tony Curtis's marriage to Janet Lee. And yes, Tony Curtis and Janet Lee are Jamie Lee Curtis's parents. The, the 
woman behind the Halloween franchise and who's in Knives Out right now on Netflix. These are her parents. And the thing was that Jerry Lewis didn't want to dress as a woman. He was like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So uh, he refused the role. Years later, when Jack Lemmon got nominated for an Oscar for playing Jerry in Some Like It Hot, Jack Lemmon would send Jerry Lewis a box of chocolates every year, thanking him for his career. And he did it right up until his death in 2001. Billy Wilder also considered Frank Sinatra to play the lead, Joe, but they were going to meet for lunch to discuss it, and Frank Sinatra stood Billy Wilder up, so Billy Wilder just moved right the hell on. So there you go. Now, the part of Sugar Cane Kowalczyk that was played by Marilyn Monroe, they didn't think they could get a star as big as Marilyn Monroe, so they had in mind Mitzi Gaynor. And when Marilyn Monroe actually contacted Billy Wilder and said that she wanted to play the part, she was a big enough star that they were like, okay, you can have Jack Lemmon. If Marilyn Monroe is doing this movie, we don't care who else is in it. People aren't going to come for anybody else but Marilyn Monroe. And the funny thing is, Billy Wilder and Marilyn Monroe had worked together on the seven-year itch. So Billy Wilder already knew how problematic Marilyn Monroe could be, but I guess the movie Seven Year Itch was such a big hit, even though Marilyn Monroe's not the lead actress in it. And I'm sure having her dress blown up over her head didn't hurt anybody either. This movie was nominated for a lot of awards. Jack Lemmon was nominated. The movie itself was nominated, even though Billy Wilder wasn't. In fact, it was the only film at the 1959 Oscars that was nominated even though the director wasn't. The only Oscar win that this movie got was for Ori Kelly. Ori Kelly did the costume design, and he designed the wardrobe for the whole movie, but he designed Marilyn Monroe's costume specifically. But Ori Kelly had a great reputation for dressing women. He was able to put women into costumes that helped hide those perceived flaws on film. Because of that, they also got him to do Jack Lemmon and... Tony Curtis's wardrobe because the wardrobe that had initially been pulled for them didn't fit very well. They weren't really very uh, flattering, so he ended up designing their wardrobe too, and then subsequently was the only Oscar winner for this film, and rightly so. I think he did an excellent job. One of the things that was interesting about this film was it was set in the 20s, actually the, almost the end of the 20s, uh, during Prohibition, and one of the main reasons for that was because of Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis dressing as women. They felt that a more modern 1960s, uh, late 50s, 60s wardrobe wouldn't be easy to hide their male form in because in the 50s it was all very tight-fitted waists and things like that and they would have just looked lurchish next to these women who were all girdled and corseted it up. So by putting them in flapper clothing, that clothing was straight up and down. So there was really no emphasis for a waist that needed to be addressed. So it ended up being in their favor to make it a period film. Another thing that happened with this film, as I say, it was filmed in 1958. They were making color film then. It was not a rarity to have a film shot in color. But they decided to shoot this one in black and white, mainly because when they did the screen test for the makeup for Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon, they looked green. They looked a little greenish on screen. There was a problem with their makeup making them look ghoulish. And so... The way to combat that was just to shoot it in black and white. Now, the big problem with that was Marilyn Monroe had a contract that stipulated all of her movies be shot in color. La-di-da. So, Billy Wilder had to actually talk to Marilyn Monroe about that and, and uh, get her to agree to being shot in black and white. Which she did, especially I think after she saw the, the tests and saw how ghoulish uh, Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis looked. But the other rumor was Marilyn Monroe was pregnant during the filming of this film. I think she miscarried after filming or very close to the end of filming. But either way, because of that, shooting in black and white also helped them hide her figure. Something else that was interesting, Tony Curtis talks in a falsetto in this movie as Josephine, but they ended up redubbing his voice with actor Paul Fries, uh, because Tony Curtis even admitted that he found it very difficult to maintain that falsetto for an extended period of time. And I have to tell you, when I read that, I was shocked, because I've seen this movie a hundred times and never thought that that wasn't his voice in a falsetto. Also, they hired a female impersonator called a cabaret performer at the time named Babette to teach them how to walk in heels and act more feminine. 
And what's interesting is that Jack Lemmon, after a couple of, I guess, lessons with Babette, decided that he didn't want the lessons. And the reasoning for this was he didn't actually want to walk like a woman in high heel shoes. He thought it would be better for him as a man dressing as a woman. He wanted to walk like a man in heels. He, he thought it would look more realistic if he had trouble. And I'll tell you, <laughs> it was. He, Jack Lemmon walking in, in heels, even all of his female mannerisms were very, very funny. In fact, part of Tony Curtis's character development for his Josephine was based on how flamboyant Jack Lemmon allowed himself to be dressed as Daphne. Tony Curtis thought, well, I can't play it that large too. That's too much, too many, too many people doing the same thing. So he just thought it would be better to, to be more demure as Josephine. I'm just using that Juvia's Place uh, can, uh, eyelid primer uh, to get my eyelids ready for the gold. I just have to say, just goes on so easily and it stays tacky. There's a tacky quality to it that I like, wherein I found that the Urban Decay went chalky on my eyelids for some reason. Some of the difficulty that Marilyn Monroe had, famously, she took 47 takes to say, it's me, sugar. Uh, Billy Wilder would often write her lines down on a blackboard so she could read them. There was one scene where all she had to do was say, where's the bourbon, while opening dresser drawers looking for the bourbon and she kept getting it wrong so they wrote it on a card and put it in a drawer and then she kept opening the wrong drawer so they wrote it on a card on all the drawers. This really bothered Tony Curtis. The reason being is both he and Jack Lemmon had to have their delivery perfect every time because you never knew which take she'd get right and I guess neither of them wanted to add to delays by being the one that would screw up a line after she'd been doing it so Jack Lemmon, I guess, being a newer actor, wasn't as bothered by all of this as Tony Curtis was. But the two of them, it was re reported, would take bets on set to see how many times it would take her to get her lines right. Of course, by this point, Marilyn Monroe was known to have her acting coach, Paula Strasberg, on set. And her husband, Arthur Miller, was there as well. And they both seemed to countermand any kind of direction Billy Wilder would give Marilyn and... It just became this horrible thing. There's one scene that happens on a beach where Marilyn's talking to Tony Curtis in disguise, and they gave three days for this scene, this two-minute scene to be filmed, because Marilyn Monroe had a lot of lines to deliver. That scene took 20 minutes, but anything else took days, days to do one line. So it was very frustrating for everyone involved, for sure. When this film was originally released in 1959, the state of Kansas banned it from being shown because uh, they felt that cross-dressing was too disturbing for Kansans. And yet, as I say, they made 15, $14 million in three years. Another thing that's interesting is Tony Curtis plays this character, Shell Oil Jr., and he imitates Cary Grant. He talks like this, Cary Grant, I'm Cary Grant, darling. Now, one of the things that's funny about that is Billy Wilder's one get that he never got was to direct Cary Grant in a movie. And so uh, I think that it's charming that Tony Curtis kind of gave him that wish. I'll tell you, I didn't, I didn't, the first time I saw this movie, I didn't know who Cary Grant was or what he sounded like. So for me, the thing was just him trying to sound posh and rich. I didn't really think of it as any other thing. So it's not something that hurts the movie if you don't know what he's doing, but I'll tell you, anyone who watches the movie and doesn't know who Cary Grant is will say, why is he talking like that? <laughs> That's why. Now, as far as this movie's concerned, it starts off quickly. This is a two-hour movie. I would just like to point this out. There weren't a lot of two-hour movies at the time. Do you know what I mean? There were some, but most, of the, most films are about an hour and a half. So this one being two hours, it moves so fast. The movie starts off with a hearse driving down the mean streets of Chicago. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're set upon by a cop car that starts opening fire and shooting at this hearse. The people in the hearse, the men in the hearse, you know, are all like, oh, what's going on? So they pull on this lever and the bunting in the roof all opens and there's machine guns in the roof. And they open fire on the cop car and cause the car to swerve and stop following them. and. They arrive at this funeral parlor and you see that the coffin is filled with booze. So they unload the, the, the hearse 
While this is happening, another cop car has pulled up in the alley across from the funeral parlor, and this detective gets out of it with this nefarious character, Toothpick Charlie, we find out is his name. And Toothpick Charlie is snitching on Spats Columbo and his mob by saying that that's Spats' speakeasy, they sell booze in there, and they're breaking the law, all kinds of ways. So the cop goes into the funeral parlor and says uh, that he's one of the pallbearers and they take him to the back of the shop, pull a lever on the organ that's being played and this d secret door opens and all this music and smoke comes pouring out and you realize that's the speakeasy back there and he gets in there and he takes a seat and orders a drink and while that's all happening, there's girls dancing on the stage and a band playing and we meet Jerry and Joe, the saxophonist and the bass player. And Jerry's really excited because they're finally getting paid. And Jerry needs to get his uh, tooth fixed. Apparently, there's something wrong with it. And Joe's like, well, we're not going to fix your tooth. We, we, we owe money to all the girls. We owe back rent. We have an outstanding grocery bill. And Jerry's like, oh, you're right. We should uh, pay all that off. And he goes, no, we're going to bet this money uh, at the track. Apparently he's got a tip on a, I can't remember if it's a dog track or a horse track, but either way, Joe's got a tip and Jerry, apparently this is a running theme with them. He's not, he's none too pleased to know this. So while they're talking, Jerry notices the cop in the front row. And the reason he knows that it's a cop in the front row is he's taken his badge off of his, from inside his coat and is using the pin to poke a hole in his cigar because it's gone out. And he, He's like to Joe and they look and it's like, oh, and so they start packing up their instruments. As they're in the middle of packing up their instruments, the cops bust in and they start arresting everybody. So Joe and Jerry are able to sneak out while all that's going on. Once they realize that they're, they're safe and away from uh, getting arrested, Jerry says, well, I guess that, that's that. We don't have to worry about who we're going to pay off first. And Joe says, I wonder how much the bookie will give us for our overcoats. The next scene, you see them both without overcoats. It's Chicago. It's snowing. It's not good. It's Valentine's February. So they're going through this building where all the music agents are looking to see if there's any gigs. And they finally get to one door and they open it, go, anything today? And instead of saying nothing, the receptionist yells at him, why you got a lot of nerve? And he, thank you, closes the door. This is a, a woman, one of the endless line of women that he has done wrong Joe she calls them back into the office and he tries to make up some sob story saying well Jerry's got a bad tooth he needed me to go with him to the dentist for a blood transfusion we're both type O and it's like isn't there anything anything and, and she's like well you know there is this gig it's for three weeks it's in Florida and they need a bass and a sax and they're like, oh, great, we'll go in and talk to Poyakov. And it's like, well, he's in there with somebody right now. You have to wait. So the person that Poyakov's in his office with is the people that need this bass and sax player, a Sweet Sue and her uh, manager, Beanstalk. And they have an all-female band. And this is the thing. They need a, a female saxophone player and a female bass player so when they leave joe and jerry come busting in it's like oh are we too late for the florida gig and Poyakov's like this isn't a gig for you it's like why not you got to be 25 we could pass for that you got to be blonde well we could dye our hair and you got to be women and jerry says well we could just as joe goes no we couldn't in the meantime Poyakov says to them well there's a saint valentine's dance you could play at it's out of town but it pays 12 bucks and jerry's like i'm not traveling 100 miles for 12 bucks and he goes we can get one of the coats out of hawk and so they go up to the receptionist, Nellie Weinmeyer, and it's like, Nellie, baby, says Joe, what are you doing tonight? And she's like, why? And he's like, well, I just was wondering and getting all close and lovey-dovey with her. And she's like, well, I'm not doing anything good. Then you won't need your car. The next scene is Jerry and Joe off at this garage to pick up Nellie's car to get to this gig. There's a bunch of guys playing cards in the back of this garage. One of them is Toothpick Charlie. This other car comes barreling into the garage and uh, all these guys hop out of it and they've all got uh, machine guns and Spats Columbo gets out and they make everybody all stand up against the wall and they shoot everybody. Everyone gets killed. Rat -ta 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 -ta. As that happens, they see Jerry and Joe and they're like, get out here you guys. And just as they're about to shoot Jerry and Joe, Toothpick Charlie 
gets the strength up to make one last attempt to reach for the phone to call for the police and Spatz grabs the machine gun out of his henchman's hands and kills Toothpick Charlie and while that happens Joe and Jerry tear out of there they're, they're in the next scene is they're in a drugstore or something using the public phone and Joe's like we're gonna we gotta get out of town it's like yeah we'll need this guy's we'll uh, get beards and he says yeah we are gonna get out of town but we're gonna shave and he's like shave and then he starts talking in this falsetto voice saying I hear you're looking for a couple of girl musicians and then the next scene is the two of them in drag at the train station walking towards the train <laughs> And Jack Lemmon's just kind of like walking. He's got this blonde wig and this hat. And he's just and <laughs> Tony Curtis. Throughout this whole movie is just tight. His shoulders are in. His arms are in. He's kind of and he's got this pierced mouth. And he's just walking and not. And it's just so funny. And while they're walking, Jerry's like, "Oh my God, how do women do this? It's drafty. Uh, I feel like everyone's." looking at me and he's like are you kidding with those legs and then as they're talking Marilyn Monroe walks by and she looks fantastic and she's just in this long overcoat that hugs her and shows off her shape as they as she walks by Jerry's like it's like jello on springs I'm telling you it's a different sex and Joe says well no one's telling you asking you to have a baby so they come up to the car where Sweet Sue and Beanstalk are greeting the girls and getting them signed in and they realize this is the new sax and bass player for the band and Suze looks at them it's like something's not right. Joe says I'm Josephine Sax and <laughs> Jerry's supposed to be Geraldine and he goes and I'm Daphne and Tony Curtis is like what? Where did you study? And she <laughs> the Sheboygan Conservatory of Music. For three years they say and as Jack Lemmon walks up the stairs to get into the the uh, train he trips He's very clumsy, and this is the whole thing about Daphne as a character. She's just very organic and clumsy and weird, and <laughs> Beanstalk like, pats her on the bum, ups a daisy, and she's like, fresh. And he says to Sweet Sue, you better tell those other girls uh, to tone it down. we got a couple of real ladies on this train. And so as Joe and Daphne get into the train and meet the other girls they're all like yeah welcome to no man's land yeah take step off your girdle and stay a while and daphne says oh well i don't wear one myself and one of the girls well don't you ball just like oh my dear i have the most divine seamstress she comes in twice a week and i'll tell you she is so inexpensive and josephine's like come on daphne as josephine and daphne are taking off their coat daphne is going on and on about, oh, look at all that talent. And Josephine's like, this isn't what we're here for. And Daphne goes to put her coat on what looks like just this wire, but it's the emergency brake. And Josephine grabs her and goes, that's the emergency brake. As she grabs her, Daphne's like, well, you did it. You tore one of my chests off. And he's like, well, you better go to the bathroom to fix it. And she's like, well, you better come help me. And so they go to the bathroom and that's where they meet Marilyn Monroe. She's in there pulling a flask out of her garter. And she's startled to see them because she's been caught drinking before and they don't allow drinking. Sugar Cane is her name. She lets them know about the band. She puts her flask back in her uh, her stocking and she goes, am I seem straight? And Daphne's like, I'll say. And Daphne laughs throughout this whole movie like, ha ha ha. She does this, this ha, ha. It's so funny and so unladylike. And as she leaves, they're like, <laughs> boy, we've been playing with the wrong bands. And Tony Curtis grabs him again and says, like, listen, you got to hold it together. And he's like, yeah, tore them again. Sugar sings with the band. She plays ukulele and sings. And on the train, they're rehearsing this song, Running Wild. And at the end of the song, the flask she had in the bathroom falls out to the floor. And she almost gets in trouble for it. Except that Daphne says, oh, uh, Mr. Beanstalk, can I have my flask, please? And he's like, your flask? And she's like, yeah, just a little bourbon. It must have slipped through. <laughs> so later they're getting ready for bed and Daphne's up in the upper berth. Daphne's just, she looks like a kid in a candy store and says as much. She just sees all of these women in various states of undress in their 90s, half out of their 90s, on the way back from the loo in their 90s. And, and then he sees sugar down the end. He's like, Hey, sugar. And she's like, night, honey. And Daphne says to Joe, did you get a load of that, honey? And he's like, but it takes the stairs off of the berth. He goes, well, honey's staying in her hive tonight. And later, while they're all sleeping, Marilyn Monroe sneaks out of her berth and goes into Daphne's. And Daphne's asleep. And 
when Sugar pops her head into her berth, Daphne sits up suddenly, but she's in a berth in a train, so she hits her head immediately. Oh. And so while Sugar's thanking her for covering for her, Sweet Sue gets up to go to the bathroom or some such thing. So Sugar jumps into Daphne's berth and Daphne's like, whoa, whoa. and she starts sweating and she's, whoa. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm coming down with a cold and, and, and Sugar's like, oh, well, I should get out of here. I'm highly susceptible. And she says to Sugar, you know, the best thing for a cold is a shot of bourbon. And Sugar's like, oh, do you have any? And she's like, no, but I know where I can get some. And so she hangs out of the berth down into Josephine's, opens her suitcase and pulls out a bottle while Sugar's holding on to her legs up in the upper berth. And, of course, Daphne slips and falls to the ground. It's just so funny. How's the bottle? Half full. And then they get back. As just as Daphne gets back into the berth, the trombone player sees this and comes to check on what's happening. And inadvertently, it ends up that there's a party in Daphne's berth. And they're drinking. And, and, and it's just very funny. And, of course, Josephine wakes up. And it's like, what's going on? It looks like Sugar's getting out of the berth. Like, oh, good for you, Sugar. Okay, now the rest of you girls. And Sugar's just actually gone off to get ice. And... So she get, grabs um, Josephine and gets her to help her. And so they get to know each other a bit more in the bathroom. We find out that Sugar's got a long history of dating the wrong guy. And it's always saxophone players. I just, I don't know what it is about them. I just, they play four bars of Come to Be My Melancholy Baby and I come to them. And, and, and Josephine, she's like, I play sax. <laughs> Well, you're a girl, thank goodness. And anyway, so in a, while they're getting to know each other, Daphne and the rest of the band are just becoming girlfriends. They're just giggling and laughing, and so much so that Daphne gets the hiccups. And they're like, rub some ice on her neck, and they start tickling her. And she's like, oh, no. And she freaks out, so she grabs the emergency brake. Everybody falls out of the berth and rush back to their own berths just in time for Sue to poke her head out of hers and see that nothing's going on. Beanstalk, she yells. The next scene is them arriving in Florida at this hotel, and Marilyn Monroe has said, well, I want to meet a millionaire. No more musicians for me. I want a millionaire. I want him to have a yacht. <laughs> and so as they're walking up to the hotel, all these millionaires sitting on the porch, and they're all old, and they're like, oh, my goodness. Sugar and Josephine go into the hotel, as Daphne's bringing up the rear, holding, carrying all the instruments. And as she walks up the stairs, one of her shoes falls off. And Osgood Fielding III, a millionaire with a yacht, uh, he rushes to help her put her shoe back on. So he walks Daphne to the elevator. He said, oh, can I help you with the instruments? She just piles them all on top of you. Why aren't you a sweetheart? And off they go. And we find out that Osgood has a, a history of chasing women who are in the theater and his uh, mama doesn't approve and the last relationship he had was with a contortionist. He says she could smoke a cigarette with her toes. Zowie. But mama broke it up. It's like, oh, she doesn't approve of people in show business? And he goes, no, he doesn't like, she doesn't like people who smoke. And Daphne's like... And so they get into the elevator and it's funny because the elevator, we see the needle go up and then it goes boing and comes back down and Daphne's like... Well, I never, and then slaps Osgood, and he's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, so she's like, I'll say, and off she goes, <laughs> just been fresh with her in the elevator. In the interim of Daphne getting up there, we see that Josephine has had the porter leave one of the suitcases that isn't hers. We find out that it's um, Beanstalks with all his resort clothes in it, because while she and Daphne are talking, he comes in looking for it, and then Sugar comes in looking for her ukulele, and uh, Beanstalk says, oh, there's a sneak thief, and then he leaves, and, she, and Daphne's like, oh, here it is, Shug, and so Sugar's going down to the beach to go swimming, and Daphne's like, oh, yeah, let's go to the, the beach, and, and, and Josephine's like, no, we don't have bathing suits, and Sugar goes, well, neither do I, and, and Daphne's like, well, neither does, what? And, oh, yeah, we're going to rent them, and it's like, oh, so they all go, to, so they leave, but Josephine says, uh, no, I'm staying. So... They're down at the beach having a good time. While that's all happening, Josephine has switched into Beanstalk's resort clothes, complete with glasses, because Daphne likes men who wear glasses, and uh, a, a sailor cap to show he has a yacht. <laughs> and so while the girls are down on the beach playing uh, ball, 
Sugar chases the ball and trips over Josephine, who is now dressed as this millionaire, talking like Cary Grant. Are you all right? Well, I wish you would make sure. <laughs> it's just, I, uh, once people find out who I am, they tend to like to, to sue. And uh, she's like, oh, oh, uh, oh, I'm not interested in, in knowing who you are at all. Within minutes, she finds out that he's rich and single and just the man she was hoping to meet. And that's when Daphne shows up. It's like, come on, sugar, we're going for dinner. And uh, sugar's like, no, you go ahead. I'll be all right. And Daphne starts to leave and realizes that it's Joe dressed like that. And he's talking like that. And so he grabs sugar by the hand and says, come on, let's get back to the, the room. And uh, uh, they get back to the room and to wait for Josephine. Oh, no, you have to tell Josephine what happened. And, and uh, thinking that they'll catch Josephine walking in dressed as a boy. And meanwhile, there's Josephine's voice coming from the bathroom. She's in the tub up to her chin and side singing. Now they're looking at Josephine in the tub, and she says, I met one. What? A millionaire. It's like, oh, uh, he's got a yacht. And Daphne says, and a bicycle, because how else did she get back to the hotel so quick? And after Sugar leaves, Josephine steps up out of the tub, and she's still in Shell Jr. clothing, uh, but soaking wet. And Joe's like, oh, I'll press the suit myself, because like, I'm not afraid of you. And clearly she is. And while this happens, the phone rings. It's Osgood Fielding the third calling from his yacht. He wants to take Daphne out for dinner after the show, and Josephine accepts for her on her behalf. So we cut to the the band playing. Daphne, uh, sorry, Sugar is singing um, I Want to Be Loved by You, finishes the song, and while that's happening, these flowers get delivered to Daphne from Osgood. But Josephine hands one of the flowers to Daphne, and then puts a card of his own into the flowers. It's quite a big arrangement, too. And when uh, Sugar sits down next to them, she goes, oh, these came for you. And and uh, so it says, oh, he wants to have dinner with me on his yacht. And uh, so after the after their performance, Sugar goes off to the, the boat while Daphne convinces Osgood that she doesn't want to go on the boat. And uh, so they go dancing. <laughs> So Josephine meets Daphne at the uh, dock dressed as Shell Jr., gets her to the boat, and then explains to her on the boat that uh, there was a, a, an accident with his last girlfriend and he's been unable to love ever since. And so Sugar wants to cure him of this. And he's like, well, experts couldn't. I don't see how you could. And so she starts to kiss him. And while they're doing all that on the boat, they keep cutting back to Daphne and Osgood's date. And it starts off with them dancing the tango and Daphne just has this face on her while she's dancing. And, and uh, Osgood's like, Daphne, mm-mm, you're leading again. She's like, oh, sorry. And she switches arms and off they go. It's the funniest. Thing. This movie made a star out of Jack Lemmon. I can't express this enough. It really, really did. He's just so funny in it. And so we keep cutting back and forth between them. So there's Sugar and uh, Shell Jr., kissing and he's like mm, ooh, is, I'm getting a feeling in my toes like somebody was roasting them over a s open flame and she's like well let's throw another log on the fire and then they cut back to Daphne and Osgood dancing now Daphne's got a rose in her teeth or the rose that he sent her and they're dancing and as they dance the rose ends up in Osgood's teeth and then they cut back and Shell Jr.'s glasses are fogged up now Hallelujah, praise be, he's been cured. And so our final <laughs> cut back to Daphne is her and Osgood dancing and they, they're dipping each other and the band's blindfolded. It's so funny. I mean, it, it, nothing more than that is ever inferred or suggested. It's all very acceptable socially, but it's, it's just also very funny. So Shell Jr. takes Sugar back to the hotel. It's dawn. And... Uh, as she walks in the front door, he climbs up the uh, outside of the hotel to get all the way upstairs to the uh, to her room. Daphne's in there with her maracas. Now, this is a funny thing. This scene was filmed without the maracas first. And when they showed the film to a test audience, everyone was laughing so hard at what Jack Lemmon was saying and doing that they kept missing his lines. So they thought it would be funny if Jack Lemmon had the maracas and kind of broke up his dialogue by playing them, which he does so beautifully. It's just so funny. So he's lying on the bed playing his maracas, just cha-cha-cha, as Shell Jr., Joe, comes through the, 
the balcony window. And well, how did it go with Osgood? And he's like, uh, he proposed and he gave her a, a diamond bracelet and they're planning a June wedding. And <laughs> Tony Curtis is like, what are you talking about? You can't marry him. He's like, you're a boy. Remind yourself, you're a boy. I'm a boy. I'm a boy. I'm a boy. Oh. Daphne's like, never will I find another man who's so good to me. And so while they're talking, <laughs> Sugar knocks on the door and she comes in to tell them all about her date with Shell Oil and... Daphne's starting to get very annoyed by all of this. It's like, because, you know, he's just out and out lied to her about everything and uh, he's feeling bad for Sugar. And But Sugar's feeling great about the whole situation. So the next day, Daphne's wearing Osgood's trinket and they're going to hawk the, the, the bracelet so they can get away from all of this. Daphne's fixing her makeup and in the mirror she sees Spats Columbo. Well, the whole mob is down in Florida for a convention. So they get into the elevator to get the hell back up to their room and figure out what to do next. And while they're in the elevator and the doors are starting to close, the somebody else, hold the elevator. And of course it's Spats and his boys. And the boys start flirting with Daphne and Joe. So they rush up to their room. While they're getting everything together, Joe calls Sugar and breaks up with her as Shell Jr. And while he's breaking up with her, he takes Daphne's bracelets and puts it in a box of flowers, all of which Fielding gave Daphne and kicks it across the hall to her door. So while all that's happening, Daphne's getting ready and notices her bracelet's not in its box. Like, what's going on? And then that's when Sugar comes into their room, clearly depressed. Daphne sees she's wearing her bracelet and uh, that's where Sugar says, where's the bourbon? And she's opening drawers and... Uh, one of, the, one of the lines she supposedly gets wrong. In fact, she says the line with her back to the camera, so there's even rumors that people think she, she was dubbed, that line got dubbed. But anyway, after Sugar leaves, Daphne and, and Josephine, in full drag, go out the window and down with their instruments, and they end up on this balcony that happens to be Spats, Columbo's room, <laughs> and all of his gangsters are there. And they see these two women coming down and they're like, they don't really make anything of it except, oh, come in, join us. And they're like, oh, and they continue down, but leave the instruments. And one of the henchmen grabs the instruments and Spats is like, bull fiddle, sax, those are the guys from the garage. And uh, so they go tearing out the door to cut them off in the lobby. Once the room's empty, the two hop back up onto the balcony and then follow them kind of out like behind them. So... That's where they see a bellhop and uh, one of the millionaires in a wheelchair in the hall and they follow them into a room and the next time we see them, Jerry is dressed as the bellhop and Joe is the millionaire in the wheelchair. They're walking through the lobby. Nobody's notice, noticing anything, although everyone's on full alert. The whole mob is like looking at everybody and watching everybody as they walk in. As Jerry pushes Josephine in the wheelchair by, they look down because they hear clicking and they look down and the bellhop's wearing, still wearing his high heel shoes and they're like, and so they chase them and they end up in this banquet hall and hide under a table just as the whole mob is coming in for their convention. Under the table where they're hiding, you see all these feet start, as people sit at the table, all these feet, one of the feet have spats on. They're sitting right, right in front of spats, Columbo. So... This whole meeting has been called because little Bonaparte is not happy with Spats Colombo killing Toothpick Charlie. Apparently they were altar boys together. To show that bygones are bygones, little Bonaparte says, well, the boys heard it was your birthday, so he got you a little cake. And he's like, well, my birthday ain't for th six months or something. And he's like, what's a few months between friends? They bring out this huge cake. And as they sing for He's a Jolly Good Fellow, this guy pops out of the top of it and shoots <laughs> Spats and his boys. And they, their feet all start to slide under the table where Jerry and Joe are, and they freak out and pop out. And that's where now all of the mob sees, sees them. It's like, oh, my God, it's this guy. Get him. And so they chase them out of there. And it's just this fast chase scene. The boys run up the stairs as the camera follows them up the stairs, it lands on the elevator, and the elevator literally starts to come down, and they come out dressed as Josephine and, and Daphne again. And Joe says to Daphne, you've got to call Osgood and get him to... We'll, we'll take his boat out of the country, because they're watching the train stations and, and everything. We won't be able to get out of this state alive. So Jerry goes off to the payphones to call Osgood, 
And while that's happening, Josephine hears Sugar singing. She's singing I'm Through With Love with the band. And clearly, Sugar's just devastated. And when she finishes her song, <laughs> Josephine comes up to her and goes, There, there, Sugar, no tears, and kisses her passionately. As she's doing that, the mob's like, There she is! And he, so he tears off. And, and Sugar's like, <laughs> And she follows her. Daphne and Josephine sneak out of the hotel under the gurney that they use to get Spats Colombo out of the hotel in. Sugar grabs a bike that's just leaning on the, the front of the stairs to the hotel, and she tears off to the, the dock. Osgood's waiting there with his boat. They, uh, Josephine and Daphne hop in, and she goes, This is my girlfriend. She's going to be a bridesmaid. Marilyn Monroe on her bike comes tearing down the stairs and comes running, Wait for sugar! And she hops into the boat. Daphne says, Flower girl! So while they're driving away, Joe is saying, Oh, I'm no good for you, sugar. Uh, I'm one of those saxophone players. You know, you, you, you need to uh, forget all about me. She goes, That's it. Talk me out of it. And so while they're in the back of the boat, clearly starting their relationship Daphne starts talking to Osgood it's like Osgood <laughs> this isn't gonna work she goes I'm um, I'm not a natural blonde he goes I don't care and she says um I can never have children he's like I don't care and then the last thing he says is he takes off his wig and says Osgood I'm a man and Osgood says well nobody's perfect and the credits roll, and that's the end of the movie. The funny thing about that last line is Billy Wilder and I.A.L. Diamond had never intended that to be the last line. They, they, they felt they had a better line in them. They thought, we, we can get a better line. So they really weren't worried. Most films always do pick up scenes after the fact anyway. So they knew that they would have some time to come up with something better. Either they never did, or the line just tested really well, or whatever but it ended up being the line that they used in the film. And I'm almost done. I'm just going to throw on some lipstick and change my top and give myself some her, and I'll be right back. And there we go. This is the final look. I want to point out that this wig was sent to me by Denise Yerneau. Uh, she styled it off of a Marilyn Monroe style, so I thought it was appropriate to wear this for this review of Some Like It Hot. I also want to send a big old shout out to Ace Bute. They did not send this to me. I am not on a PR list. I'm not saying I would say no to a PR list, but I'm not on a PR list. But Ace Beauty is one of the best, them, Juvia's Place, they're, they're my two favorites. And this palette, the Nostalgia palette, is what I use today for this look. And I just think that this is one of the best for color, for pigmentation, for blendability. They did such a great job with this, so I want to thank them for making such a thing because, I mean, good grief. How else would we get through life if it were for color and glamour? Uh, of course, my NYX Contour Palette, which I use, the Anastasia Beverly Hills, Alyssa Edwards, yes, that's who that is, Alyssa Ed Edwards Palette, and, of course, Fumi Desilu Vold's collab with Juvia's Place, her Queen Palette. This is what I use for my blush, and I just want to send a shout-out to Percy Blue, for my earrings, I love these. And of course, then the jewels. I glitter, I sparkle, I can't help it. So there you go. That is my review or two cents towards Some Like It Hot. To me, this is the best cross-dressing slash drag queen slash men in dress movies. Jack Lemmon as Daphne is a must-see role. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have a suggestion for a film that you would like me to cover, chances are it's on my list because I watch a lot of movies, but there's always one or two people suggest to me, and I'm like, oh, I, I didn't even think of that one. So uh, do, do suggest any film that you think I should uh, uh, review. Right now, I'm trying to do films that I think all drag queens should see. Whether you're a new drag queen, an established drag queen, uh, an old queen, a young queen, I don't care. I don't care. If you haven't seen Some Like It Hot, you have to see it right this minute, or you should slap yourself in the face, is all I'm saying. Um, but uh, I will be doing a couple more uh, what I consider to be classic drag films to watch. Not that the people in it are in drag, but 
that I think they influence the culture of drag. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like it. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please do that. And if you are subscribed, then share this video with somebody you think might enjoy it and would like to subscribe to my channel. And until the next Makeup and Movies, miss me! Mwah! Ooh, now it's time for popcorn. <laughs> Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.